oneness is the highest truth of the universe. And so any degree to which you are living out of alignment with the law of one, you're going to suffer mm. because you're fighting reality and you're contradicting reality. And so reality in its sort of mercy has to somehow show you that you're contradicting the way things really are. And it does that through what we call suffering. Suffering is like the wake-up call to change your relationship with life, with reality. And until we do that to the point where everything is a loving relationship, then we're gonna suffer to some degree, right? So love becomes the savior of third density suffering. It becomes our North Star, right? To get us out of this hell we're in and lead us into heaven, which is fourth density. Aaron, it's been a minute since we last connected. I almost want to say three or four months ago, but there's a phrase, you know, good things come to those who wait, which is like Indeed. a byproduct of your story that we're going to talk about today. If people don't know you, if they haven't seen the, the Instagram and the YouTube and like, you know, the coolest, most fun, most educational part of self that you project mm -hmm. <laughs> onto the social medias, who is Aaron Abke today? What do you represent for the world and for yourself? It's a big question to jump off and start yeah, like that. Yeah. But, but I, I mean, I want to go real deep with you today. This concept of God and these um, seven layers, the, the seven densities of consciousness, like this ain't going to be for somebody that just wants to stick their toe in the water. So so for us to begin, man, what what is your contribution to the world today? And mm. I guess, how would you describe yourself? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this chat and get to jam with you a little bit. Likewise. I'll say it this way. Aaron Abke is a divine idea being made manifest through this consciousness I refer to as I. So what I do in the world currently is um, a lot of YouTube, a lot of uh, video content, discussing a lot of the stuff we're gonna talk about today. Um, most people probably find me through uh, studying A Course in Miracles and or The Law of One. Those are the two texts that I would say have been most influential in my spiritual development and where I draw most of my inspiration for teaching from. I grew up as a pastor's kid in evangelical Christianity. You didn't grow up Christian, did you? Um, kind of. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll peel that out. Okay. My anger towards God and my, my reassurance of what God actually is. Yeah. But I gotta, I gotta stop you because let's go slow with your personal story. I'm, I just meant like how you serve the world now. So if somebody didn't know you and like, maybe they just came across your channel, is it really about consciousness or is it about freedom? Cause mm -hmm. I know one unlocks the other. Yeah. And essentially I would assume that from my experience and you, you share with me, your work is really about accessing the freedom that people already have but there's a unique way in which you do that. Mm -hmm. so talk a little bit about that. This is the question that always comes up, like sitting next to a stranger on the airplane or whatever, or a Uber driver, like, what do you do for a living? And I, I try to refine, how do, how do I explain what I do for a living to someone who may have no clue about the stuff I'm teaching? You know? So I'll usually say, um, I teach you know, mindfulness and self-awareness and things like that to uh, help people get free from suffering. So yeah, I would say that if someone comes to my channel, they're going to they're gonna feel that this is a channel that is devoted to helping me learn how to free myself from my self-inflicted suffering. Mm, that's a big phrase, self-inflicted suffering, because I, I think about all the ways that I still catch myself doing that. Even with all my trainings and, and all the discoveries about myself and about what God really is, like the lessons still unfold, man. I'm sure even at your level, like even with, it's like 17 million views, that you've had on YouTube now with that much service to others, this concept we'll talk about service to others, service to self. Yeah. There, there's so much learning that I'm sure that you've had about yourself by being of service to others and even probably parts of your shadow mm -hmm. that you had to take an honest look at, but, but taking all that into account, like there's got to be something that <clears throat> e even now still fascinates you about this work. Like mm -hmm. I know you had a Kundalini awakening, which we'll go into, and you've been deep into the arts of mysticism and esoterics, but, but what still continues to fascinate you now uh, about the work that you do? What really lights me up these days is the art of embodiment and integration, because we can collect so much spiritual knowledge. We can read so many books and watch so many videos and even be able to explain this stuff really well but that doesn't necessarily translate to actual inner freedom. 
right? The, the embodiment of the truth is what translates to inner freedom. And as you said, the, it's like the deeper you go into yourself, into your inner world, as you like to say, uh, the more you realize how deep it is, mm-hmm. right? And you sort of have this, at some point you have an epiphany of, oh, this journey of you know, self-actualization and self-crystallization, whatever you want to call it, never ends. We don't, there's no finish line. We could just say that the nature of what we're seeing in ourself and working on embodying and bringing into manifestation gets subtler and maybe has less suffering involved in it. But nevertheless, there's parts of our awareness that we're, we're seeing have blind spots still and need refining and purifying. To me, that is just uh, the greatest purpose, the greatest function we can have here is to be more and more that perfect expression of the divine idea, as I like to say, that you are. You know, you are a divine idea in God's mind, and you're experiencing the journey of actualizing that divine idea, right? Un- unlocking all of your potential that exists within you. To me, that's the the real purpose of, of living and being alive is self-actualization. Nothing else at the end of the day will quench that longing we feel inside other than bringing our divine essence through. So if you want to call that, you know, self-awareness embodiment, that works. But yeah, to me that it never stops getting more exciting. Dude, I can feel the weight in that because I am, I'm pretty exhausted at this point of all the media out there where it's just ideas from like the neck up. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of heady stuff in the world. And and maybe you can help us bring this down to planet earth, like here in the 3d, where there is this understanding that we've talked about on the show with so many guests, man. And that is that I am you and you are me. We're Mm -hmm. a unique point of consciousness that individuates Mm -hmm. itself as Aaron Abke in the flesh or Josh Trent in the flesh. In other words, God is no thing and everything at the same time. And and you and I are God experiencing God's self. And there's this, there's this really big narrative where I feel like it it gets um, abused, honestly. And, and one thing I know that you stand for when I was looking at your work and just sitting here with you now is about the pure essence of truth. Mm-hmm. Like where does truth actually come from? Is your subjective truth of God also the objective truth that mm-hmm. we all can experience if we have the proper conscious mirror, if we can actually look into it for, and see it for what it is? So when you were in the church, let's go pull the e-break way back, mm-hmm. your, your understanding of this, this consciousness, this individuation of consciousness, God experiencing God's self, that was totally not the case. And whenever we um, put out shows that mention God, people usually get fairly upset with the mm-hmm. word G-O-D. Right. And I always, I always feel like, well, that's an invitation to explore why that triggers you so much. But take us to the church, because I, mm-hmm. I could assume that being a pastor's son, there was a lot of pressure for you to show up in that way. And then when you went to Oral Roberts University and you studied what you studied there, like there had to have been some part of you that in the very beginning, maybe in the first couple of years, it seemed like you started to feel a disconnect already. Like mm-hmm. you had gotten into the work and there was a part of you that was like, no. Mm-hmm, <laughs> so mm-hmm. take us to the moment where you, where your soul said no to the the specific religious upbringing and, and being an Oral, Oral Roberts University. I can't even imagine how hard that would have been to say no because of your environment, because mm-hmm. of how much pressure I'm sure you felt. Well, I was very blessed that the church that I grew up in, my my parents' church, was just the best expression of Western Christianity that's possible, I think, in that we just all emphasized the best ideas about God. God is love. God is forgiveness. All are welcome. Jesus loves everyone. And we, we really, like, I don't remember a single sermon my dad ever preached on hell or damnation or the rapture or whatever. None of those really dogmatic teachings, right? Even though I didn't understand oneness at all as a Christian, even though Jesus embodied oneness so perfectly, Christianity ironically has no understanding of oneness, which is why it doesn't understand the person of Jesus or Jesus's teachings. We can get to that later. But what my parents did give me very well in terms of a reflection of God is the the knowing that God is love. If God is anything, God is the experience of love. So when I was you know, 18, some of these ideas started rubbing me the wrong way. I would read the Bible and all of a sudden things that didn't stand out to me or trigger me when I was in my early teens, like all of a sudden it started bothering me a lot. Like that seems contradictory. And I started questioning the ideas like hell and, and biblical inerrancy and, and whatnot. 
when I was like an 18, 19 years old, but it slowly evolved until I got my first full-time church job at 23 after Earl Roberts University. I got a full-time job as a worship pastor, and that was a church that was very opposite to my parents' church, super dogmatic, super legalistic. Every sermon is about hell and the rapture and, you know, only our denomination will be saved because only we believe correctly. It was just so off-putting and gross to me. This podcast is brought to you by Cozy Earth, creators of viscose bamboo and linen, bedding, loungewear, and temperature-regulating, naturally breathable clothing that feels freaking amazing and that is sourced responsibly. I mean, let's face it, cheap clothes wear out fast and they fade. But there's a reason why Cozy Earth has been featured on Oprah's Favorite Things. I've been rocking Cozy Earth's men's hoodie and pants for a while now, and this unique fabric provides next level comfort. They have this four-way stretch technology that whether you're a man or a woman, you are going to absolutely love these clothes. They're the most cushy, comfy, cozy, good-looking, and durable clothing I have ever purchased. I was just telling Carrie Michelle this yesterday, how much I love these clothes and I'm pretty much gonna buy one of everything. <laughs> you can take a test drive, just head over to CozyEarth.com, use the code Josh, J-O-S-H. They're offering you a super generous discount, 40% off, 40% off site-wide for a limited time. Use the code Josh to get 40% off at CozyEarth.com. But I'm like leading worship for this church and I have to be, I have to sit through every sermon. So I didn't even make it three months into that job before I was like, I got to have a talk with my pastor and just be honest. I can't handle this internal conflict anymore. And there was there was a number of things that happened at that church I could get into that were real big wake-up calls. Um, the biggest wake-up call, the final one where I kind of snapped um, towards my my pastor at the time was we our church was in downtown San Jose. So we had a lot of homeless people around our campus. And at that time, I was really into like Jesus was... Uh, the, uh, a kind of, you know, savior for the poor and the destitute and the brokenhearted and the widow and the orphan. And that was really my like relationship towards Jesus. So seeing homeless people every day, I would like go out and talk to them or give them some food, feeling like I want to be Jesus to these people. And one day there's a guy sleeping on the front of our church steps and uh, in a sleeping bag. And I heard my pastor talk, like mention something about him in his office. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to go heat up my uh, at the time, I wasn't very healthy, so I was eating a hot pocket, and I was like, "I'm gonna go <laughs> heat up pre fitness model days, way pre fitness model." Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna go heat up my hot pocket and give it to him, and then pray for him. So by the time I got out from heating up the hot pocket, there was an ambulance there, and they were strapping this homeless guy onto a gurney, and um, they had to go through the church and then out the back down the ramp because they couldn't go down the stairs. So they're taking this guy through the church. And um, are we allowed to swear on? Yes. It? Okay. So the the homeless guy was screaming fuck you church motherfuckers over and over and over. And my pastor was sitting there and he was like, oh, I can't stand to hear this cursing in the house of God. And the stench of hypocrisy in that moment in the air, just I, it triggered me so much. And so I, I said something like, um, oh, and then the cops that were taking him out said, come on, man, in the house of God, really have some respect, save it for outside. And they were trying to get him to shut up. And so I just sort of screamed out. I was like, no, he's right. That's exactly what we are. Let him say it. And that was like as triggered as I've ever been in my life. So I'm, I've always been a very like introverted, not very self-expressive kid growing up. And so my pastor, you know, hears me and he knows that that's very out of character for Aaron to act like that. And he was like, Aaron, come to my office. So I was like, gladly. So I walk up to his office and he's like, what was that all about? And I just told him like, look, I don't believe anything you guys teach here. I think you you teach a hypocritical view of Jesus and God, and I can't stand being here, honestly. Like, I need to I need to hang it up, and you need to find a new worship pastor. So I moved back to Oklahoma after that, and that's where I went to college and just started a new seeking journey on what do I believe about the divine or who God is? Because if I know one thing for certain, I definitely don't believe in that monolithic religious view of God up in the sky somewhere you know, commanding who suffers and who goes to heaven. I don't believe in that. I know that's not true. So is there such a thing as a God? So I went through a closet atheist period and then started really getting into near death experiences. Cause I'm like, if anybody knows if there's a God, it's people who've died probably. So I'm reading NDEs all day, every day. And it's, 
it's bringing me back to peace of mind a bit now because I'm like, okay, I think I can believe that there is such a thing as God, but it's just very different maybe than how I've thought of it. Mm-hmm. But all these people are saying that there is a source and that that source is unconditional love, which is what I grew up believing. So then I got into Buddhism, Hinduism, Eastern traditions, eventually found A Course in Miracles and the Law of One. Everything evolved gradually into what you and I would understand as unity consciousness or oneness. And then from that framework, looking back at the person of Jesus, who Jesus was, what his teachings were really pointing to, that changed everything for me. Dude, I could imagine when you said, I'm out, that the pastor and maybe even your dad, I don't know, totally rejected the path that you went on, the closet atheism. Oh, yeah. How was that? Well, so I never came out as an atheist on like Facebook or anything. Hence but, the closet. Okay. I was like, yeah, what is the closet? Atheist? Always in the closet. Yeah. But I did go on uh, Facebook about, I don't believe in hell. I don't believe the Bible is inerrant. I don't believe Jesus is returning one day. I don't believe any of this stuff. And here's why. Like, let's argue, you know, bring it on. So I was debating people on Facebook all the time. And that was a time when my, my ego was still very, very strong. So I wanted to make people look stupid for what they believed and project that part of myself that used to believe that stuff. So I went through that period and worked some of that stuff out. Mm. And then just this really like, I'll tell you what happened, Josh, was that I got so obsessed with studying non-duality and Eastern philosophy because I had been lacking the knowledge department my whole life with God. I I had a deep devotion in the heart. I loved God with all my heart. I was a worship leader, right? But I had really screwed up knowledge of God. God is separate. God is jealous. God is angry. God punishes. So my soul was crying out for like, I want to know truth. I want to know who the divine really is. And I can't live another day until I know. And that served me very well for sure. But after so much time just in the masculine, um, making God into an intellectual pursuit I noticed that I was still suffering a lot internally, a lot of depression. You know, I'd been divorced at a young age from my then Christian wife and all that. So had a falling outs with my life, friends, family, ex-wife. So I had a lot of shadow to process and I was just, it was coming up and catching up to me. So I started crying out to God and saying like, God, what do I got to do at this point to be free of this pain? Like I meditate. I practice forgiveness. I fucking pray every day. What else do you want from me? And uh, this voice just resonated inside of me in response to that question. And it said, Aaron, did you forget that God is love? And it just all dawned on me in that moment, like, holy shit, I totally did. I totally forgot that what you are is love. And I had been making you this intellectual pursuit for so long which I needed, but I have, I have to come back to love at some point. And it was like, I literally almost like a, a trauma that you forget because mm. it's so traumatic. I forgot how I grew up my whole life. I would lock myself in my room and just put on worship music and sing and dance to God and just pour my heart out. I was so in love with God. I would talk to God in my mind all day. And it's like all those memories came flooding back when I had that realization because I had kind of suppressed that part of me that was traumatized from Christianity you know, you can throw out the baby with the bathwater when you're traumatized, but there was a lot of good stuff about my Christian upbringing that I needed to bring back full circle. And it was that embodiment of truth, which is love in the heart. And that was when a real turning point happened in my, in my mind, in my suffering, uh, bringing the worship, the devotion, the love of God back into my life, um, really kind of brought the mind back to the heart, um, which I like to call wholeheartedness it made me wholehearted again which I was for so long, all mind, no heart, right? And that's just a recipe for pain Mm. if you can't learn to love yourself. The paradox is real because we need the mind in this physical body to understand what God is. Otherwise, you and I couldn't articulate it. You couldn't put out content. Right. We wouldn't be able to understand what God is if we didn't have a mind yet. In the paradox, the mind is also what, if we allow it to, removes God from our lives uh-huh. because of pain, or, or I guess you could say the the deepest part of the ego that just mm-hmm. wants to keep us safe. Yeah, and I don't judge the ego. You know, I don't necessarily agree at all with Ryan Holiday's work. The ego is the enemy. Mm-hmm. I actually think the ego is a friend. It's a protector. Yeah, and so it you know calls upon this massive cosmic basement of everything that's happened to you and I 
Also, if you look at emotional epigenetics, everything that's happened to your mother, your grandparents, your great greats mm -hmm. going further back. And then there's these other realms, yeah. which, which we're going to talk about, you know, the, the seven densities of consciousness. This is totally fascinating to me because a lot of the stuff that you and I are going to explore, if, if y'all aren't careful, you could, this could be too much mental for you. Oh yeah. Right. So, so slowly and, and, you know, I guess you could say methodically guide us through this. Mm -hmm. It was in the 1980s that three people started to understand what this was, the law of one, the seven densities of consciousness. Mm -hmm. One of them was a questioner, one was a scribe, and one was a channeler. Mm -hmm. Now, at first audible, people might be like, whoa, this is very esoteric. And maybe it is, mm -hmm. but there's also some very significant truth into this. In the 80s, I was born in 1980. What year were you born? 89. Okay, 89. So in the eighties, like this wasn't necessarily the prime conversation. No, this, this was not like what was going on Oprah or nope. any of the talk shows was Oprah around then in the eighties. I, I think, think so. I think she was. Yeah. So, so in your, in your discovery process where you were shedding the, the harmful parts, the, the fire and brimstone and only believing in God, because if you don't, you'll die aspect mm -hmm. of faith. Yeah. Once you started to clean that out, it opened up a part of you this wholeheartedness that started to receive new input on what and how God actually is in you and in all of us. Mm -hmm. So what was that? And how did you come across this work of the law of one? Do you remember where you were? Was it more cumulative or was it like mm -hmm. one moment where you just got flooded with the law of one? Yeah, it definitely wasn't one moment. <clears throat> it kind of streamed into my life gradually. It was one of those books that it's like on your radar for a long time and people mention it here and there. And you're like, I want to read that but it started to grow until I was like, I need to read the law of one. Like I got to just read it already. And so I um, found the audiobook and listened to it. And uh, my mind was absolutely blown to pieces because the law of one, this is what everybody says about the law of one. This is the number one feedback I get on all my law of one videos is people will say, it's like part of me somewhere already knew all of this. And I'm just remembering it for the first time. Mm. The law of one basically is an explanation, a metaphysical explanation of the universe in which we live. And it has this amazing, unique ability to satisfy so many questions about like, why are we here? What's all this about? Um, is there a purpose behind what we're seeing? Uh, you know, these questions that should seem obvious that the average person doesn't even ask very much, but to people like you and I, we can't stop asking those I've questions. I've been hungry for that question ever since I was a little boy. Yeah. I've, I've always been like, why do adults treat each other so poorly? Mm -hmm. What else is there besides that? Yeah. Whatever that essence is, which is really a search for God. Yeah. I just didn't know it at the time. Right. So please, I digress. Like, I think all of us have felt that, that interstitial yeah. tension. And we wonder what else is there? What's this all about? <laughs> So the best way to look at what we call consciousness, and I, lo I love this model the law of one gives, is like a color wheel. So if you're on like, you know, paint or some editing program, Canva, you pull up the color wheel to choose your color and it's, the colors bleed into each other. There's no separation between the colors. They just sort of bleed into each other. Mm. So we have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. The law of one says consciousness is actually like that in that we are moving through the color wheel of consciousness. And uh, of course, the seven uh, densities correlate to our seven chakras and the seven colors of the color wheel. It's kind of a, it's a universal archetype that's built in, right? So I like to say the simplest explanation of the densities of consciousness is you could think of them like the chakras of the universe, in that the universe has a seven part progression in its uh, return back to the creator, back to source, just like we do in our seven energy centers. So if you know what energy centers are, this will be a pretty easy conversation to follow. If you aren't familiar with chakras, then you know we'll try to distill it for you a little bit. But each energy center, as most people know, represents like a different aspect of our being, right? Our expression, our personality, whatever. And so each density correlates to what that chakra represents, but instead of on a micro level, on the macro level. So for example, the first chakra we know is the root chakra, which is red. And the first density is the red density, which is the density of, they call it being or beingness. So this is when the physical universe just begins, right? You just have the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space. 
and for billions of years, as far as we know, those five elements of the first density interact and mesh with each other and create planets and stars. And after so much interaction, consciousness begins to evolve from the first density into the second density, which is the correlates to the second chakra, the sacral. That's the orange ray energy center. And orange is the color of awareness. So the second density of consciousness was when, let's say, Earth has formed, an ocean has formed on the planet after billions of years. It's just I can't even really fathom that with my mind. It's, it's great no, to hear you yeah. say that, but like, how could we even know what that is? Yeah. That amount of time. Yeah. And Ra even says, the time is vast in your estimation, but meaningless in total because there's no time in the universe. It, there's no such thing as a long time for the universe, right? It's just a mental idea. So the second density is growth and movement. So anything that can interact and move with its environment would be considered a second density life form. So this is where consciousness gains the ability to um, be an individual self, even though it's not aware that it is yet, it can have an environment and it interacts and everything from microbial life, which is where second density would start through insects, plants and animals, and even like pets would be like the latest stage of a second density creature. That's all second density. Now, when the mind does this thing <clears throat> where it kind of flips in on itself and becomes an object to itself, and it says, I am, I exist, I am aware of what I am. That's the beginning of third density, the yellow ray solar plexus chakra. And that's when, when all three of the lower chakras are available, that's when the ego is created. The ego is our sense of being an individual separate self that's separate from the universe and moving within it and, and fighting against it and struggling against it, but not one with it, right? That's third density consciousness. So that's the consciousness that humanity is currently in. This is what the law of one teaches, but we're actually uh, just now beginning to transition into the fourth density, mm. which of course correlates to the heart chakra, the green ray. And that's the density of love and unity. So after consciousness spends a couple hundred thousand years in third density uh, with tribal warfare and competition and murder and genocide and all these horrible atrocities that happen in third density, like you don't see animals committing genocide with one another, right? There's this balance nature has built yeah. in. Well, after consciousness suffers from the belief in separation, which is third density, it forces consciousness to learn, you know, is there a better way to be in the universe? Is there a better way to exist here? Because of the pain. Because of the pain. So the pain is necessary. It's an evolutionary driving force, absolutely. From third to fourth density. From third to fourth density. It's the vehicle, right, that moves consciousness forward because you can't stay there forever. Because, dude, that's been this looming question for me is if we're going to evolve, does it always have to come from the vacuum and the contrast of pain and suffering? And in some way, whether it's Buddha or whether it's the Tao or whether it's Christianity or any kind of faith-based practicum, it always seems like there is this high-low pressure. Yeah. And I think it was Aristotle, you know, nature hates a vacuum. And then Watts took that on and then made it really popular. That vacuum is actually the yin yang. It's the, it's the God experiencing God's self. Almost so you could even say Satan, the fallen angel, right? Yeah. Like we, we need all these things to talk about. And even, you know, that's why I, I warned y'all, like this is a very heart-based, very faith-based conversation. But if you're not careful, your mind can start going way out there and pull you away from the teachings that that you're actually bringing to us. So in this fourth part, it's the the physicality. This is also the the paranormal, right? There can mm -hmm. be like ex extraterrestrials in in the the fourth uh, in in the fourth uh, density. So I think about the way that you and I experience each other. Like we can feel each other. We have the micro muscles in our face. You're looking at me to see if I'm safe. I'm looking at you to see if you're safe. And like. That's how we figure each other out. Mm -hmm. What is the the physical? What is the physicality of this fourth density? Why is that mm -hmm. so important that we're in a physical body on this path to achieve oneness? Mm -hmm. Essentially, mm -hmm. what's that all about? Yeah. Well, the law of one teaches essentially that the body is the learning device that consciousness is using. So, like just that that first three densities progression I just explained, you see how consciousness has to take to us a lot of time to experience existing and evolving, right? Imagine how complicated and complex and nuanced the human experience is compared to like a rock or, you know, water. Like 
infinitely more complex, even from a, a pet, right? A uh, late second density pet, the difference in the amount of nuances your dog grapples with every day and you, it's like a thousand fold, right? So obviously you couldn't just first exist here as a human. Like how would consciousness even have the reference frame to be a human being without having experienced everything leading up to it, right? It's a progression. Mm. So we're bleeding through the color wheel of consciousness. So you've had what it is what is being taught here. You've had hundreds, maybe thousands of past lives from everything from a rock to an insect, to a plant, to an animal, in order for you to be equipped to be a human. And you've probably had 50 human lifetimes already too, right? So you're this very complex, evolved spiritual being. And you are, if you're alive on the planet right now, you, you are on the cusp of moving from the solar plexus chakra to the heart chakra, which is, and I'll just sort of explain this in layman's terms. This is what fourth density consciousness understands. This is what all the pain and suffering of third density consciousness teaches to the heart, which is that all things exist in relationship in the universe. You can't find anything in the universe that isn't in relationship to something. And that's obvious, but the implications of that means that oneness is the highest truth of the universe. And so any degree to which you are living out of alignment with the law of one, you're going to suffer mm. because you're fighting reality and you're contradicting reality. And so reality in its sort of mercy has to somehow show you that you're contradicting the way things really are. And it does that through what we call suffering. Suffering is like the wake up call to change how you're, change your relationship with life, with reality. And until we do that to the point where everything is a loving relationship, then we're going to suffer to some degree, right? So love becomes the savior of third density suffering in that it's it becomes our North Star, right? To get us out of this, this hell we're in and lead us into heaven, which is fourth density. Why do they call it density? This is an interesting <laughs> phrase. Because mm -hmm. when I think of something dense, it's like less porous than <clears throat> other things. So if it's less porous, does that mean that as you go up in density there is less applicability to change. In other words, if you're first density, mm -hmm. you're very porous. You're very ripe for other energy coming into you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be so porous. Mm -hmm. So then as you get up to the seventh density, maybe we'll get there, maybe not. I know that you're here to transform people in number four, right. which I think is the most important because it's literally where we are. It's where we are. In the stage, right? Yeah. We're not nirvana beings floating around right. blessing one another 24-7. Yeah. So is it about porousness in, in the density aspect of the conversation? What's that all about, the, the density? Yeah, you're on the right track. It's... What we're talking about when we use the word density is actually light. Mm. So here's the best way to explain it. If I have a photon on this side that's vibrating 100 times a second, and then I have a photon on this side that's vibrating a million times a second, where is there more density of light? Which photon? Indulge us. The, the one that's vibrating a million times a second, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Way more light in a million vibrations per second than a hundred. Mm -hmm. So this is where we have to understand consciousness through the uh, concept of light. C light and consciousness are really one. We could say light is the way that consciousness is made manifest. It's, I know it's very esoteric, but the first creation in the universe is light. And actually everything is light, as we know in quantum mechanics, everything is light in some kind of entangled quantum relationship. So it's the density of light we're talking about. The more light that there is in a given space, the more information there is, because light is information. The more information there is, the more ability consciousness has to express itself. So that's the key to the density is that the more dense your consciousness is with light, the brighter it is, right? The yeah. more density of light, the brighter the light is. Uh, the more information is available for consciousness to express itself. Hence why a rock is first density. It can't really express a whole lot. Like its rockness is its expression, but it can't like walk around or go have a relationship with another rock. But second, third density, a human, how much more ability does consciousness have through this vehicle to express itself through relationship mm. and all this kind of stuff? So, so yeah. I wonder in the fourth density why we see so much pain and suffering and really a wolf in sheep's clothing in the media narrative around gender dysphoria and little boys wanting to be little girls and, and vice versa. Like 
there's a soul sickness that I think so many people are experiencing. And it's fed from a narrative that if you honestly trace it back, it goes to the CCP and their influence in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's also some fairly large, uh, I guess you could say, dark energies that have infiltrated entertainment as well. Now, look, we don't have to spend a super long time on this because mm -hmm. the moment that we talk about it, it shines light on it. Right. We don't have to go into all the rabbit holes and tinfoil hats of what's going on. You and I both know if we breathe and check in, there's something off. There's just something straight up off with the way that humanity is being communicated to and also the way that humanity is being portrayed by the five megalith powers that control all media across mm -hmm. the world. And it's a simple search. This isn't a conspiracy theory. Like y'all can go on Wikipedia or any, any internet search. There's five companies that yeah. run the entire media on planet earth. So whoever runs those companies is really who this question is for. I'm curious with all the people that watch your channel and all these millions of views, like this conversation around intentional dysphoria and intentional mind programming, it has to come up from time to time. Mm -hmm. How does that actually, in a way, uncomfortably help us evolve, help us mm -hmm. become higher up in a density? Yeah. Well, because it leads to a lot of suffering, you know, and we see that right on full display, how much suffering is created from these, um, this super intense identification with the body of I am my gender, I am my race, I am my political view. Uh, it's, it's body consciousness, which is third density consciousness, right? I'm a body, I'm an individual, and I'm separate. And, uh, you know, every soul's at a different stage in their evolutionary journey. We've probably just had more lives where we suffered from that point of view enough that mm. we woke us up. Maybe the souls now that, that fall for that kind of propaganda are just younger souls who don't have as much experience to draw upon. It does seem to be the younger souls. Yeah. Younger age as well. Right. So they can't be judged in that sense at uh -huh. all because uh -huh. they just don't know any better. But, you know, unfortunately, they're going to have to experience the pain of this, um, this idealizing of victim consciousness. You know, it's like the in, in the mob think in our society, it's who's the greatest victim is our savior, is the greatest among us. And so this elevating of the victim is a hallmark of third density consciousness. Have you heard of the victim triangle? Yes. So it's like victim, victimizer, hero. You're just going around the triangle forever. Playing. Oh, I've heard of victim, saboteur, and prostitute, but maybe they oh, okay. maybe they go together. I mean, please continue. Yeah, well, yeah. it's just like you're either the victim or you're the victimizer or you're the hero trying to save the victim. Okay. But you go you have to go through all three. Like, you know, first you're the victim, then you become the hero because now you want to help other people who've been hurt like you were, but in trying to help them, you do what was done unto you. You, you hurt somebody else. Unconsciously. Yeah, to save that, because it's all you know. Yeah. So you attack someone else to save the victim, but now you just made yourself the victimizer. And the cycle continues, right? So how do you step out of that triangle? It has to be through fourth density consciousness, through forgiveness, through love, through understanding and compassion. For yourself, obviously first, but then for the victimizer, right? Yeah. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. Perfect statement of a fourth density being. Mm. I wonder how I just got a full body chill. I wonder how you feel about this. It's something that's come up on so many podcasts that, you know, forgive me if you've already heard this 10 times, but this is really <laughs> important. Um, King James version, Isaiah 45, seven, I form the light and create darkness. Mm -hmm. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord do all these things. What is your interpretation of that? in the dualistic model and also how we actually need the dark light here on planet earth, because mm -hmm. God is telling us through this passage, through the mind of man, that God is actually dark and light, God's self. Yeah, yeah, such a great conversation. And I think there's so much freedom to be gained here if you see it correctly. This would be something that a religious person would very much have a hard time with and say, no, 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 you know, God is only good and the devil's evil. I've heard that this, this is the old, the, the most ancient King James version where this was actually in text, but it's been removed from a lot of versions. Have you heard the same thing? Yeah, or just changed this? so much that it's not really saying the same thing. But if you go back to the source, as far as recorded history can go, yep. God is telling us God is dark and light, God's self. Yes, because only God is. So you have to say, if you know there's only one being in the universe, that's the law of one, then you have to say in some way, God is doing the evil. But how is the impertinent question, how is God doing the evil? And the distinction for me is that 
Uh, even the law of one says the, the creator does not blink at the light or the darkness. It doesn't see a, it doesn't see inferior or superior. It doesn't say light's better than dark, but we still need some dark. It's completely neutral. It's both are equal in its eyes. And that's because both are equally necessary for God to know itself. Mm. I've heard Paul check use this quote of the devil is like the mirror God holds up to itself to see its reflection because God is and only is love at the end of the day. God is perfect unity, absolute harmony and perfection without any disharmony at all. But God can't know those aspects of itself without some kind of reflection because there's not like a second God who can stroll over and have a conversation with God like you and I are and say, hey, did you know that you're love and <laughs> what love is? Like God's clueless. God's all right. alone in the universe. Yeah. So what it does is it projects the exact opposite of its essence into time space. And that's where duality is created, which the whole manifest universe is those two polarities. But now the opposite of God's nature, which is separation and fear and all of that, now becomes the mirror that by God tasting what it's not, it has a new understanding of what it is, mm. right? So the illusion teaches the truth what it is in a sense. So in that, to that regard, we do need the darkness as much as the light. And God is playing the part of the darkness, but only because God veils itself from its memory, from its knowledge of itself. That's how the darkness is created is through the ignorance of God. And God has to do that because in God's real nature, yet again, it can't be anything but love. Yeah. People can go to a thousand different medicine ceremonies and try to access mm -hmm. what we're talking about right now. But but I'm talking about the real essence, like the deep down truth, the, the highest level of truth that we could ever experience would be this oneness, this mm -hmm. this lack of separation. There's no such thing as a separateness between you and I. We're just individuations right. of that same source energy. And, and at first audible, people might hear that, that are maybe beginning on the path mm -hmm. and they might dismiss it because it just seems either too good to be true or honestly, what I've had to deal with in yeah. many ceremonies, it's too painful to be true because if there's no meaning to mm -hmm. anything and there's also no meaning to anything, <laughs> then you just make meaning on whatever side of it that you feel resonant with. In other words, if you think there's no meaning and you want to be a nihilist, then, you know, my work would be not to judge you. And then if you mm -hmm. think there is no meaning, so you want to love your children, love your wife, love your husband, love God, love what you do in the world till it bleeds from your hands. Well then great. But it's really about this power of choice or the free will component. We haven't talked about that yet. So in fourth density consciousness, when does free will start to come online for the individuation that God gives? When does that actually happen? Well, free will, that's a big one. In one sense, I think you could say that gaining self-awareness, awareness of love and unity, that would be what actually constitutes free will from one perspective. Because if someone isn't aware of their wrong beliefs about the universe, you know, they don't know that they're operating with a totally twisted, distorted lens of what reality is. Yes. They're hating everyone. They're judging everyone. They're trying to conquer people and, and other things to possess them and be happy. That's such a contradiction of the nature of the universe. So it has to feel painful and not satisfy you. But if, no, if they don't know that and they don't have these truths we're discussing, then they literally can't behave any other way, right? They don't have any other reference frame available. So they yeah. have to behave according to separation. So is there free will to behave beyond yourself? Well, you'd say no. And like, think of a color you've never seen. Do you have the free will to do that? You say, well, no. So from that sense, the conditioned mind, the ego mind is the total absence of free will. It's a robot. It's, it's a program. It's conditioning, right? And it's running you and pretending to be you. But when you gain awareness of that and start to transcend those patterns and programs, then we could say, ah, free will is arising in, in the mind now. But then if we get into like deep non-duality, we could talk about, well, there is no free will because it's all just God. You know, it's all if you want to use the word predestined, you know, we could go into all that too. But I think relatively to this conversation, that's the best way to see free will is the dawning of self-awareness. And in that dawning of self-awareness, there is some recipe ingredient list. I don't know. I like cooking. So that's what comes to mind. But like <laughs> there's Aaron, there's something about free will. And even when I've had um, people on the show that have studied more of like the Akashic records or maybe like the, the Indian philosophy 
where they talk about the karma and the dharma mm-hmm. and, and the dharma being like our life purpose, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're obviously in your dharma. Otherwise you wouldn't be sitting here. I wouldn't want you on the show and, <laughs> and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, right? Because I love it. I love this. Yeah. I love the realness of which we're connecting. And, and, and that's why people are with us. But then karma comes in with its credit card on a spiritual basis and it starts to have us pay debt. Yeah. And I've heard that the more debt that we accumulate from many lives, the the essentially harder choice it w- it will be for us to embody free will. If if I've led my lives fifty lives yeah. like a like a demon, you know, mm-hmm. or like somebody that just was totally not caring about others, and and consciously and unconsciously chose to hurt others, when I finally show up for the reckoning in whatever lifetime or life form that I choose, I'm going to have to pay off that debt. Yeah. What do you make of of that from the Indian philosophy and? And how is that blended into your teachings now? Yeah. Well, the Indian philosophy is my favorite by far, as far as a, a spiritual modality. Um, when, when we're talking about this concept of karma, now we can see karma from everything I've just been explaining about separation consciousness. Karma is any action you take based in the belief in separation. So we could say the universe is like a balance sheet and the, the law of the universe is oneness. So every action you commit in time and space from the view or belief in oneness is a credit. And every action you take based from the belief that you're separate from the universe is a debt. And that debt is your karma, right? So karma is the return movement of your separation-based actions. Because again, the universe has to teach you that all is one. And how does it teach you all is one? by letting you experience the consequences of separation. So it's going to force you eventually to make a different, it's like how you train a dog or something, right? It shits on the rug, you bop its nose with the newspaper, and it's going to do it like 20 more times until eventually it learns, oh, don't shit, don't get bopped. Ah, okay, I can go outside. Like that's all the universe is doing to us in a simplistic way. It's Careful, teaching. dude, PETA's coming in right now. <laughs> Animal he, abuse. It's not him. He's not the one that's bopping the dogs. This is other people. And it's a very loving bop. Very gentle. Okay, okay. <laughs> but yeah, does that make sense? So It makes perfect sense. And I loved it because I, I know, y'all replay that again, because this, I guess you could say law of chaos and order, mm-hmm. this, this law of one is, it, it seems to me like this is the highest order. There mm-hmm. is no other law that supersedes this law. And within this law, there's many probably other laws that I've heard, but they all point to an origin point of the law of one. Yes, no, maybe. Yeah. It seems like that to me. The universe is both, you know, childlike, simple, and un- unimaginably complex at the same time. Like we can sort of understand it all very easily through the lens of oneness. And let's look at every law we know of the law of karma, the law of attraction, and let's just boil it down to oneness. And we can understand why and how those laws work the way they do, because all is one. So whatever I give out has to come back to me. There's nowhere else for it to go because only the one exists. Very simple, right? But then we can get into the metaphysics of the seven densities and all this stuff. And we could podcast for the next million years and not explain the whole universe. Yeah. So it's paradoxical. And and it's funny because within the paradox, there's more paradoxes. In other words, the further you go, the more you're going to find of the yeah. same thing. It's, it's infinite. It's, it's the same thing that you're, it's almost like, um, you know, when you put like a mirror up in the bathroom and it just goes, and there's, yeah, yeah. there's unlimited like amounts of mirrors that go back, but you're actually just having two mirrors look at each other. And that's right. what creates the, the fractal. Yeah. So I wonder with all the people that are coming to your channel and even the clients that you work with and, and all the work that you've been doing, and also the contrast and the pain that you yourself had to go through as part of your dharma, as part of your karma, there is probably some overwhelming sense now of what love really is that might have been mm-hmm. totally different of you in the closet singing and connecting with God. It's almost like you had to go through all of that pain to get you where you are now. Mm-hmm. Can you expand on that a little bit? Because somebody's in pain right now, they're with us right now, yeah. and they're attaching to the pain as if it's their only end point. And it's just simply not true. Yeah. Yeah, this is um, the most important thing we can talk about, I think, is that the only savior that exists for consciousness at this level is love. Until we embody love, you know, our, our embodiment of love is our return to unity, right? 
It's our return to the remembrance that all is one. That's why the law of one calls it the service to others path. You have to get beyond yourself at some point, the little self, the separate ego self. You have to get beyond that self and begin to share what you are with, with others. And to me, that's what you know, books like A Course in Miracles have taught me is that love is not a possessing of something. They call that the special relationship, you know, a special romantic partner that makes me feel so good. That's not real love because it's all based on possessing and acquiring and specialness. Love is unconditional. It thinks no thought of itself and it just extends itself. And so because of that, love has an infinite supply of power, endless infinite supply of power. And that's the positive polarity. Like I think about the sun, right? The sun is radiating light forever, giving off light. And so it makes itself the source of light by giving it. Uh, the negative polarity is like a black hole and that it's always pulling in, possessing, acquiring, absorbing, and has an endless need for power that can't be satisfied. So you're, you're really either one or the other, right? depending on the direction you're going, spiritually speaking, mm. you're either moving towards love or towards ego mm. in any moment. And that's what the course says is there's only two thought systems available, God's thought system or AKA reality and the ego's thought system, which is a total illusion. And your only problem is you've been suffering because you've been following this thought system that's based on um, illusion mm. rather than truth. If you just change the way you're seeing to God's thought system, you'll be indescribably happy. And so what is that changing? How do we move from one thought system to the other? It has to be through the heart, through love, learning to love ourselves, learning to love everything, because then we start to join with the universe, right? The universe is one. The universe exists only in relationship and in oneness. So there's this kind of unbroken chain of giving and receiving happening in the universe, right? The sun gives light to the earth. The earth gives life to us. Everything's depending on everything else. Mm. So as soon as you get beyond yourself and start loving others, like if you're depressed, the worst thing you can do is think, how do I get undepressed? You know, it's like go to a children's hospital and love someone who's suffering. And mm -hmm. I promise you, it's going to lift you out of that depression. When you get beyond yourself, it's like you join that cooperative dance in the universe. And then you find this happiness within you because now you're joined with the whole. And that's what happiness is. Mm, this is the only thing in my life that's pulled me out of anxiety and depression is my breath. And because when mm. I breathe, if I can breathe, I can choose. Yeah. It's, in Italian, it's on my arms. Say, posso respirare, posso scegliere. Oh. So if I can breathe, which is what we did that's before beautiful. we started the pod, then I access through my physicality and that density, a greater capacity for awareness, a greater capacity, like even what brought you to fitness. What brought you to fitness was your seeking. How long were you a trainer? quite a while. Right. And, and it was in Silicon, years. Silicon Valley. Yeah. Okay. So I, I was a trainer for 10 years. And so oh, that's right. That was my background of like, I was seeking wellness. I was seeking wholeness. I was, I was seeking this completion only through the body, only through the body. And now it's so interesting because father of one baby, second baby on the way, the, the laws of the, the physicalness is what I'm learning now. Like I'm mm -hmm. relearning what it is to not just care about solely how I look. Yeah. I'm relearning what it is to really understand what my body is asking me for. And so I'm curious for you, like when you finally left fitness mm -hmm. and you started to go into, I believe it was 2001 that your channel really started to blow up. Uh, 2018 or 19. 2000. Okay. So this is pre pandemic. And then when the pandemic hit, people were really searching for answers. So yeah. the, the timing of what you do, bringing people back to the law of one, there was something that was really necessary for you mm -hmm. to, to be a trainer. Like what, what kind of contrast did you get that was not ego integration, that was really egoic in nature, which unfortunately, not the whole fitness industry, man, but a lot of the fitness right. industry, unfortunately, is, is very lower density. Like it's only yeah. about how you look. Yeah. But what gifts did you get from that? There was some, there was some kind of gift yeah, that you yeah. got from fitness that, that allowed you to ha have your hunger for truth be quenched in some way. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you'll appreciate this. Uh, one obvious gift that I've realized in retrospect that came with so many years of obsessing over fitness and disciplining the body is this ability to suffer and sit with pain for a greater purpose, you know? Yes. To get really fit, you have to suffer a lot in the gym, uh, especially if I did CrossFit for five years, like competitive CrossFit, like I want to go to the games. You, you have know. to learn to enjoy the suffering. You literally have to trick your mind into enjoying pain. That's what CrossFit is. <laughs> it. 
bunch of people who have tricked themselves into liking pain. Yes. And so uh, that translates right to everything because everything's connected. If you can really suffer physically and be okay with it, you'll probably be a lot better at suffering mentally, emotionally, and being able to sit with it, especially once you know that just like lifting a dumbbell is going to make my bicep stronger, when I can just sit with an uncomfortable feeling and just be okay with it's okay to feel really depressed right now. I'm not unspiritual because I feel depressed. I'm not separate from God because I feel it's okay. It's just a feeling. Well, I'm flexing a spiritual muscle now, right? I'm cultivating a kind of inner strength to be present with what is. And going back to the masculine feminine, this is where we need the feminine to integrate our our healing and our, our growth. Because at least in the circles I run in and, and what I've done for so long in my spiritual journey is try to heal always and only through a masculine method of understanding the root trauma and trying to apply a self-inquiry method or whatever. And you can get to the root of lots of traumas that way and you still don't feel a somatic release because at the end of the day, you're not just okay to feel shitty and love that part of you and teach yourself that, hey, love has an endless ability to respond to anything. So you're never alone. You're always safe. It's safe to feel anything that arises because love is always present. How do you teach yourself that other than by giving love, right? You got to give love to experience love. Love is a relationship, right? So it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Like you said, it can't exist in a vacuum. It can only exist in a relationship of some kind. And so a lot of us have this broken relationship to ourself where we've discarded and, and rejected and hated and resented these parts of us that are in pain still. Mm -hmm. And so no amount of non-duality and wisdom is going to help you out of that situation because at the end of the day, your inner child's afraid to feel something. And it doesn't matter what you tell the inner child, it's going to be afraid until it feels safe, right? The body is an antenna that gives and receives information. So whether you're a spiritual person or a scientific person or both, I'm kind of both, you, we know, you know, our vibe attracts our tribe, literally. So if you've been working on creating a cleaner, more energetic antenna, look no further than creating it by tapping into an ancient system in your body called ketones. Most people think of ketones as weight loss. And yes, while weight loss is a byproduct of ketones, Really, ketones give you energy, mental clarity, a better metabolism, and a host of other benefits that science and my own personal anecdotal experience have absolutely proven. I take a shot in the afternoon from my friends over at HVMN, otherwise known as Health Via Modern Nutrition. Every two or three o'clock with my afternoon energy dip, I just take a quick shot of the ketone IQ. It's freaking amazing. It gives me a burst of energy. I get my focus back. I can finish out my work day with a smile. If you've been looking for something, but not just a stimulant, right? Maybe you've had a battle with coffee or caffeine. You just don't want to do caffeine in the afternoons. This is the antidote to caffeine that still gives you a great burst of energy. Just head over to joshtrent.com forward slash HVMN. Use the code Josh to get 20% off your order. You can buy the recurring order. You can get the little shots to put in your gym bag or at your desk joshtrend.com forward slash HVMN. I know you're going to enjoy this ketone shot that really the body only creates ketones when you're fasting, but you can get these ketones without fasting. Check out the link joshtrend.com forward slash HVMN. Enjoy this incredible benefit of ketones, metabolism, cognition, and energy. What were the parts of Aaron Abke that had to be attended to, loved, and healed in order for your relationship with your dad, with your mom, to not be something that held you back from your own consciousness expanding? Well, for me, the big, <clears throat> the big battle through my 20s was this um, sort of belief in inadequacy. One of the things I teach in my programs is the three beliefs of the ego, that there's really just three root beliefs that the ego is ever operating from, and it can make lots of different variations of them all, but disguised behind it all is one of three beliefs. And... Even those three stem from the original belief, which is separation. I believe I'm separate from source. That's it. But once I believe that, the mind can create these three different pathways to express the belief in separation. The first belief is the belief in lack. So this fundamental core belief we all have as a human that something's just missing in me, just not good enough, not quite worthy enough. I got to go do something, complete myself somehow. I'm, I'm lacking something. That will create the second belief eventually, which is, um, I call it outcome happiness. 
humans run with this underlying assumption behind almost everything we do that this outcome will make me happy. When period. I have this much money, then I can breathe. Yep. Then I'll truly be happy, I like to call it. But what they don't know is once you hit that number, there's just more things there's to focus on. There's a new outcome. <laughs> there's... The ego just replaces one outcome on the pedestal with another one. I, you I honestly acquire it. Did you feel did you ever feel that way about money? And was that conditioning around money based on mom and dad's views? That's a good question. Um, my parents were we were not super wealthy growing up. Mm -hmm. Pastors aren't usually wealthy. So um I had a very pretty modest upbringing, but yeah, getting getting more money than I ever thought I would make in my life in my late twenties did have to trigger a lot of my lack beliefs around money because all of a sudden uh, your bank account's the most important thing in your mind where before you just hated it and didn't want to look at it. And now you're obsessing over it. And when it goes in the negative, you get freaked out. So I had to go through some of that stuff, but tracing it back to the root belief for me is, is the key to transcending it because the ego wants to keep you caught up in the story. And a lot of times trauma chasing, like people that need to find the root of why do I have this pattern? It must be because I was abused at this age. It's like, look, you sort of have to give that up at a certain point and just say, I believe I'm separate from love. That's, that's the truth at the end of the day. I think I'm separate from God, from source. And once you accept that and love that part of yourself that fears that it's separate and that God doesn't love it or whatever, then you actually start to feel loved because now you're giving love to yourself. Mm -hmm. Only what I have not given can ever be lacking because it all comes from within me. So if I'm not giving something, how can I ever know it exists in me? The giving is the proof of having, right? So there was the lack. There was the goal-oriented way mm -hmm. of life. And the, what was the third? The third belief is flows downstream of the second belief, which is essentially I'm in control. I'm the doer. I'm in control. I make the gears of life turn based on my decisions. I act independently from the universe such that I can even fight against the universe sometimes, mm. or I can conquer parts of the universe. It's this most distorted expression of the belief that you're separate. Because if all is one, then there isn't some isolated self somewhere choosing to do things in opposition to the universe, right? Uh, of course, a miracle says there's just God's will. Only God's will exists. And if you think there's any other kind of will, that's just a delusion on your part. So if you were to look back, if you were to float above your timeline <laughs> and you had a spaceship and you looked back at the previous version of Aaron and you with love, you just looked at him and just saw him for where he was maybe when the bank account was like the biggest deal and there was the cords popping of like the old beliefs around what money actually is. The reason I'm asking you this is because I've gone through my own freaking journey mm -hmm. when it comes to money. Like what does money actually mean to me? And, and I can say in my body to you, that money is truly just a vehicle of expression of energy. Yeah. And it's not, yes, it is a spiritual thing, but it's actually really practical. Mm -hmm. It's really awesome mm -hmm. because when I give you my time, my energy, I, I just, and I do it in a loving way, I receive abundance from the universe. Yeah. I never, ever thought I would say that. Yeah. Seven years ago, like being $75,000 in debt, I would have never sat here and told you that but I went through this understanding of maybe yeah. the three aspects that you've mentioned by which all connect to the separateness, the illusion of separateness. Yeah. Was there a moment where you really felt one of those three connected to the illusion of separateness that you knew it was time to cut? And how exactly did you cut that to make it practical for, for yeah, everyone with yeah, yeah. us? Yeah. I, I love, I love talking about this from a practical standpoint, because there is a very practical way to apply the awareness of these beliefs and how to correct them. For me with money, it's, it's the same as you express that at some point you just realize it's kind of just a reflection of the value that I'm giving out into the universe. Because again, giving and receiving are one in the law of oneness. So if you want to get something, you have to first give it and then it can return back to you. What you keep, you lose from the law of one, right? Once you start focusing on giving value out rather than like, how do I make money? How do I get people to pay me money? It's such a negative way of thinking about money. Instead, it's like, how do I give so much value out such that money has to come back to me? Then the universe has to mirror your value in the form of what you're asking for. So yeah, if you produce great podcasts that help change people's lives, eventually you're going to be able to make money doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's how the law of one works. Giving and receiving are one. So when I started understanding these three beliefs, it came through a uh, much more of a somatic way, which was just 
relating to my emotions of, okay, what kind of feelings do I suffer from every day? And I quickly realized it's just one of three feelings, sadness, anger, or fear. It's many variations of those three, right? But at the end of the day, those are the three root negative emotions we suffer from. And we have root chakra, sacral, solar plexus there. And so those emotions, if you understand what the emotional guidance system says, that your emotions are actually um, energetic indications of whether you're thinking and perceiving correctly about reality. So if I think something that causes a negative feeling in my body, that's actually my body reflecting back to me, and that's an incorrect way of perceiving yourself. So if I think I'm separate, I'm going to feel negative about that. And that's actually because it's not true. Hmm. So if it feels bad, if it feels negative, it's not based in eternal truth. It's not true. If it feels good, joyful, abundant, loving, compassionate, peaceful, that's the body's way of saying, ding, 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 you're perceiving reality correctly. But it all comes back to our self-perception. So your emotions are never telling you what to do. They're never saying, take this action. The mind is saying, take this action. The emotion is just giving you feedback. It's not telling you to do anything. So your emotions are never speaking to your circumstances. And that's where we go wrong, where we say, well, you can't trust your emotions because they'll lead you astray. It's like, no, actually, by the time you feel negative, your emotions are telling you you've already gone astray. You're, you're perceiving incorrectly. And then the mind will say, well, I feel angry, so I'm just going to punch somebody. And then the mind takes over from there. So when we understand what message we're getting from the emotional guidance system, we can learn to trust our feelings, have a deep relationship towards them, a positive relationship. And when I understood that, I said, well, there must be some kind of belief, right, tied to those three different emotions. Mm. What if that's true? What if I feel sad for a certain reason? What if I feel angry for a certain reason or stressed out, anxious for a certain reason? And then after spending a lot of time contemplating that, it actually became very clear and self-evident what those beliefs are. Sadness is the emotional body's cue that you're believing in lack somehow, right? You think you're lacking something in this moment. A loved one dies, uh, you have a breakup, your mind is ruminating about what it's lacking in that moment. So sadness is telling you that. Um, whenever you're angry, my mom taught me this growing up, anger is what happens when a goal gets blocked or when an outcome gets blocked, right? When you don't get what you want, anger is the response. Or when a boundary is crossed. Right, which is a kind of outcome. Don't mm -hmm. cross my boundaries, mm -hmm. right? And then anxiety or fear or, or panic, worry, stress is what happens when you believe that you're losing control over something, right? That you can't control something. I can't breathe, ah, panic attack. I can't control my breath. That's anxiety. So once I saw that, I said, well, fantastic. Now my practice is to just stay very aware of my emotions. And as soon as I recognize what feeling I'm suffering from, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell that emotion the truth that can correct its misperception. So for the belief in lack, when I feel sad, which was um, probably my greatest catalyst was depression. How long was the depression? Um, through most of my 20s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right after I got married, all the way through my late 20s. Um, there's a quote from A Course in Miracles I mentioned a minute ago that says, only what I have not given can ever be lacking. And so I started to repeat that to myself when I felt sad. And I, I would notice it would cause a somatic shift to happen where I started to feel better. Like, oh, that's right. It's just what I'm not giving. I'm not actually lacking love. I just haven't been giving myself love. And it would feel better to think that thought. So just going by every day, correcting that belief when you feel it happening is a very powerful way of rewiring your mind and your patterns. So then doing that with anger, when I feel angry, I just remember, oh, there's some kind of goal on a pedestal right now that I think when I get it, I'm going to be happy. And what helped me to say was, this outcome can't give me anything I really want. At the end of the day, right? It's just going to perpetuate more seeking. What I'm looking for really is just peace of mind. And that comes from not chasing stuff, right? So just remembering outcomes aren't my savior. And then oh, I feel a little somatic release there. Mm -hmm. A little peace comes over me. And then for anxiety, fear, stress, um, just repeating, I'm not in control. I'm being lived, right? The universe is living me. I'm like a wave in the ocean. 
the wave doesn't tell the ocean what to do. The wave is just an extension of the ocean. It's a, it's a oneness view, right? And then it feels, ah, oh, that's much more peaceful. God's in control. It's all going to work out whatever way it's supposed to. Mm. That became my practice for the better part of a year. And I saw so much reduction in my mental suffering in that year that I said, this, this is something I could teach other people how to do. And uh, from there, a few years later, started my first program. The, the weight of this is that it takes time. And just like you form a diamond, there's pressure that needs to be involved. Yeah. It's easy for someone to hear you say anxiety, depression, you know, peace of mind, these terms, like they're very, they can be, because I'm just, I'm getting a huge feeling right now for everyone who's here, we've heard maybe these things before. Right. And we've heard them before because they were given in an intellectual way, which is really um, the byproduct of one of the pieces you mentioned, which was the control. I'm in control. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a humility when receiving what you're talking about. Otherwise, none of this can actually yeah. seep in or, or be embodied. There, There is lessons for us beyond what you're talking about when it comes to humility. And I find that in my own life, I've really only experienced the depth and understanding of what humility actually is when I've experienced the deepest throes of pain yeah. or, or trauma or something that forced me, honestly, mm -hmm. forced me to, to be humble. How would you guide people to, to add this humility to the lessons we're talking about? Somebody could listen to this entire podcast. They could shift their life right now. Mm -hmm. Like if they're listening to it for the second or third time, the more you hear something, just like when you studied raw yeah. and when you studied the law of one, you, I think you listened to the audiobook three or four times. Right, and you nine started, times now nine times. So you started to get more and more and more truth from a, 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 a vibrational level when you heard it more. Yeah. How do you instill this humility in people, and even in yourself? How, yeah. how do you do that beyond just the throes of pain? Yeah. Well, you know, from the perspective of sort of non doership, um, it's it's kind of not something you can instill in yourself because it's something life gives you through your pain and suffering. So we could say the the best thing you could do to integrate more humility is take advantage of your life catalysts, you know, take advantage of the pain and the challenges in your life, allow them to humble you. And this is something I teach that sometimes people find to be taboo, which I think is fun. Uh, but it's, it's this idea of sometimes the best thing I can do for myself is to kind of allow something to hurt for a minute. You know what I mean? Like, I need to take in the full weight of the implications of that mistake I just made because yeah. I don't want to make it again. Yeah. And that I made that mistake because I was too arrogant, too prideful, moving through life too quick, right? Barreling down the highway too fast and life is trying to slow me down. So I would do well to say, thank you, life. I'm just going to take a minute to receive that rather than slow down, got it, and just keep going. That's kind of what we do with our life catalysts sometimes. Yes. We don't really sit and learn them and with that, um, I call it sort of, um, well, I have different ways of, of describing it. Holy embarrassment, sometimes I'll say. Like there's a righteous embarrassment of, I can't believe I just did that. I thought I was better than that. And I don't mean guilt trip yourself. I don't believe guilt is virtuous at all. Uh, it's, it's a weapon of ego, but it's like, let's just feel the, the karmic slap enough to say, all right, that's on high alert in my awareness now, I'm going to make sure I don't make that mistake again. Yeah. And when you do that, you notice that as you go into new situations that would trigger your pride to come out, there's a there's more space in you to say, mm -mm, not this time. I've learned that lesson. I like that that's phrase. humility. I like that phrase, karmic slap. Because yeah. honestly, that's exactly what it feels like. And I've gotten it through life and also through different medicines and whatnot. If you were to look back with wisdom now, <laughs> And honestly, life is going to continue to bring us these karmic slaps. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to progress from what I'm learning and I'm hearing from you in my own life. Yeah. So if you were to look back with wisdom and, and you would see from that time machine floating above, what was one of the biggest slaps you ever got? And, uh, and, and how did it give you that wisdom? Such a great question. And I probably would need to spend more time thinking about it to mm -hmm. give the best answer. But yeah. I, well, screw giving the best answer. Just give yeah. whatever's here. <laughs> so there's a... There's a way I like to describe ACIM, A Course in Miracles, in that the course kind of reads like that, where it's sort of like, hey, sweetheart, you're the problem, not the universe. If you accept that, you'll be a lot happier. So it's okay. Everything's going to be fine, but you're doing this to yourself is kind of the way the course presents itself to you. So I like to say it's, it's like a compassionate bitch slap you didn't know you needed 
You know? <laughs> I just, I sort of needed that. Yes. But I didn't know I needed it until I got slapped. Uh-huh, it's uh-huh. like, yeah, thanks, actually. I needed that, that humility. Yeah. Um, for, for me, that came more and more as I read the course because the course exposes the foolishness of the ego's thinking and the, the cringy pride and arrogance of the ego. And you start to see it more in yourself and you get more and more uh, just cringy and embarrassed and off put by those parts of you yeah. that you have to eventually love them and have compassion. But like feeling that cringe is actually the first step to breaking free from it. And so it's okay to feel that cringe. That's also acceptable. You just can't end there. That can't be the last step. The last step has to be forgiveness and acceptance. And then you have transcendence. Mm. But we guilt ourselves sometimes over feeling those feelings. Like, I thought I knew better than that. Oh, don't guilt trip yourself, brother. It's all acceptable. It's like, well, no, maybe I need to feel that for a minute. As I started teaching uh, on YouTube, I, I didn't I didn't start a YouTube channel to be a teacher. I didn't think I had any ability to teach or talk for a living. I was just so passionate about this stuff that it was like a fun, creative outlet for me to make videos on spirituality and stuff. It was a way for you to make sense for yourself in a deeper way. Yeah. By sharing it with other people. Totally. Yeah. And to my surprise, my videos started doing well. And so as they started doing well, and now suddenly I'm in this kind of public spotlight, um, as you know, it makes you have to be more self-aware because you're on full display now. Also more humble way more humble. Right. And so, yeah, there, there was a number of times where I would, uh, teach something that, uh, I got maybe a little bit ahead of myself and I, I thought I understood this the best way or the right way. And actually there was still a lot of stuff I wasn't seeing about it and I didn't present it as accurately as I could have. And then people pointing that out on the YouTube video and my ego doubling down, like, no, 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 I, this is the truth. This is the best way of seeing it. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, like I'm the one with a YouTube channel and I'm getting corrected because yeah. I think I'm right. And that is such an important humility check for someone who's going to teach because the worst thing you can do is think you know everything and think you're always right. You want to have a very open-minded skepticism. And I'm just going to speak from my experience here. This is what appears to be true for me as much as I've experienced it. Not like, I'm a teacher. Let me tell you what's true. You know, that's an ego projection of what a teacher really is. Yeah. What I've enjoyed in our podcast so far is like, you bring an incredible amount of gravitas and like, yes, you, you've been through this work, but you're also like not closed minded about sharing your own lessons, your own pain. There's nothing in my mind that's less trustable with any leader or teacher Yeah. when no matter how kindly you ask them, because one of my specialties is like, I want to know how you've suffered Mm -hmm. because I want to know how you've suffered because there's wisdom in it. Yeah, oh yeah. Pain is the ultimate teacher. Yep. And so I've enjoyed that about you today. And, and I think about how deep the research could go for somebody, all of our show notes and links and all the stuff we're going to have on this podcast. I cannot let you go unless we talk about Horus and Ra, right? Okay. The right eye and the left eye. When I was digging into this, I thought to myself, what a fascinating concept that in Egypt, there was Horus, right? The God of the sky, the left eye of Horus represents the moon. And then the right eye of Ra, which represents the sun. And also there's been a lot of of etymology around this and research where people would say one is masculine, one is feminine. Uh And I think about the way that even in ancient Egypt, there was so many things that we don't know. We just are going off of the hieroglyphics and what was Mm -hmm. recorded. This to me is ultimately cool and fascinating. Yeah, I just think like to see the eye of Horus and the eye of Ra and to really understand what the Egyptians were trying to tell us Mm -hmm. is pretty freaking amazing. And I'm sure that this has come up with the law of one and the research that you've done. So how do you make sense of of these two eyes? What do you think the Egyptians in their wisdom were trying to give to us there? What do you think that's all about? Well, it matches up perfectly with the Hindu uh, depiction of the, the two nadis on either side of the spine. Pingala Nadi is the masculine on the right side. Like you said, Ra, it represents solar energy, uh, heat, and uh, intellectual wisdom. The left side is the Ida Nadi, which is moon energy, feminine, uh, cool, and represents um, sexual energy, physical embodiment, and all of that. So that's exactly what the Egyptians are pointing at, that we have these two aspects of ourself. And in the law of one, they call it the left-hand path and the right-hand path, left hand being the feminine side. In uh, in form, the feminine represents the negative. 
which is the womb, right? Like a womb, a woman receives, takes in the man, right? The man is the penetrator. That's the positive. So in form, the feminine is the negative and the masculine is the positive. In function, the feminine is the positive and the masculine is the negative. But that's, I think, what these archetypes are showing us is that uh, Ra would call the left-hand path the service to self polarity. When you seek to serve yourself at the detriment of someone else, at the harm or at the cost of someone else, that's the left-hand path separation consciousness. When you seek to serve yourself by serving others and seeing all as one, that's the right-hand path or the positive polarity. So it's it's all there in so many cultures and Christian mysticism with the whole of the Christ oil, the sacred secretion, Kundalini in Hinduism, Horus and Ra in Egyptian mythology, uh, the Tao. All these traditions are pointing to the exact same kind of archetypes of what make us up. What do you mean where there was the oil? You just mentioned something about the uh -huh. oil and the leak, leaking. What yeah, was that? Uh, there's a a lens of Christian mysticism that uh, it's basically Christianity's Christian mysticism's way of explaining the the Kundalini. Yes, understanding Kundalini in in a, in Kundalini in Hinduism, it's called the nectar cycle, which is this process of essentially sort of sublimating our sexual energy up the spine through the energy centers from the root to the brain. And then when the, so our cerebrospinal fluid carries our sexual uh, energy or essences. This is why um, preservation of sexual energy is such a huge part of a Kundalini awakening, mostly for men. And the breath, because we actually have four diaphragms. Yep. People think of one diaphragm, we have four. Right, which is crazy. Starting at the perineum. Yes, it's like a kind of pump. Mm -hmm. That um, intense breath work is like pumping yes, it and yes. helping to move the energy when up. We talk about this in the Breathe program and it freaking blew my mind because I, I had just assumed like the diaphragm's here. Right. But no, like in order to pump that cerebrospinal fluid up and down, we've got to access all four of them. Yeah, we got a lot of pumps. There's a pump in our body. So so going back to your point though with the, the leakage and the oil. Yeah, so- after enough um, spiritual effort, so um, in, in the law of one, it's called polarizing. You can either, either polarize to the positive or the negative, just like an electron or a proton has a positive or negative charge. Law of one says we're like that. We're sort of like particles that have to choose a charge, and that's what third density is for, is which charge, which polarity do you want to be? And as we choose the positive charge, we gain more charge and consciousness which is like an attractor field that moves that energy higher towards the crown chakra. The crown, you can think of it like a huge magnet that's pulling energy up towards it. And so through spiritual effort, through lots of yoga, breath work, other kundalini practices, we can move enough of this sexual energy through the CSF up to the brain to where that's really what sets off what we classically call a kundalini awakening. When that energy meets the brain or the third eye, that's when the Hindus say Shakti and Shiva have reunited. Shakti is the feminine at the root. Shiva is the masculine at the third eye. And she makes her way up the spine to Shiva. And then they make love. And what flows down from their lovemaking is, it's called Amrita in Sanskrit, which means like golden nectar. Mm. In the Christian mystic tradition, they call it the Christ oil. And it's this um, phenomenon that will happen after so long after a Kundalini activation is you'll start to have um, a sort of mucus. It's, it feels and is described like mucus, but it's more salty. And uh, it is basically the CSF coming down the back of the throat and you swallow it and you have to cough it out and swallow it. And then that fluid goes down into the gut and starts to transform the gut and upgrade the nervous system. So sexual energy in Kundalini is kind of like the... I like to call it the currency that Kundalini uses to purchase spiritual evolution with. The more of it you preserve and allow this nectar cycle to use, uh, going from the root to the brain back into the gut, yeah. it's literally in a it's a neurobiological transformation that's actually happening, which is why people who have a Kundalini awakening become enlightened and they can perceive oneness effortlessly and they're very loving and psychic abilities tend to ignite for people. It's because literally their nervous system has upgraded to a higher frequency. And you can get it through breath, but there's also very specific practices. We're going to link our episode with Vanessa Lambert. She's a teacher for Kundalini yoga. Oh, very cool. And she talked, I know you had your awakening in 2001. Uh, 2021. 2021. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's like just a little bit of time ago. Yeah. 
So it, you're probably still, did you feel the saltiness? <laughs> did you feel that essence in your body when it happened? Yeah. And I think it still goes on. I'm, <clears throat> I'm not always sure what it is that I'm coughing up and swallowing. It could just be that I have a drainage issue, but over the last few years since this has happened, I've noticed it a lot more. And um, I can't know for sure unless I find a, let's go find a science lab who can test this stuff and yes. see if there's CSF in it. Yes. But this is what the ancient yogi masters have said for thousands of years. After you have a Kundalini activation sometime later, um, you're gonna have a lot of symptoms like XYZ. One of them is feeling like heat going through your body almost like it's through your um, meridians, I think. It's through yeah. your nervous system, a kind of burning volcanic heat. It's not painful at all, but it's like a, almost like an electric charge inside of you. And uh, I started waking up in the middle of the night, feeling my shoulders down my arms and into my fingers, like electric hot and uh, down on my feet eventually. So I'd have to get up in the middle of the night and like walk a few laps around my house because movement was the only thing that would calm it down. Uh-huh. And if I'm like sitting on the couch for too long or going to sleep, after about 20 minutes, it starts to happen. And apparently it's the result of that kundalini energy moving through your nervous system. And it's it's basically purifying every blockage in its path, every remnant of third density consciousness, it is forcing out. So this is why a kundalini awakening is known for being a kind of, it can be a psychological hell for somebody because all their traumas are coming up, <laughs> all their triggers are coming yeah. up and they don't know how to stop it. Yeah. So they think they're going crazy and they run to a Western medicine doctor who just puts them on a bunch of drugs or stuffs them in a psych ward. It's like psych wards are full of people that are having Kundalini awakenings and don't know it. Case in point, we had Paul Levy on the show. He wrote with Tico and mm. they put him in his early twenties in a mental ward because he was having his awakening. I know multiple people. And and so that's not to say that all people who were on Skid Row right. had awakenings. No, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Definitely a lot not. of them had substance abuse and that's a whole nother podcast. But when someone truly has an awakening, there is a complete death yeah. of how they used to operate and integrate into the world mm -hmm. outside of them and inside of themselves. So maybe as parting guidance, could you share about this concept of integration? which is really like like this table, right? This table is so, I love this table so much. It's a slab nice. of perota from a tree in Tamarindo, Costa Rica. Big tree. A huge tree. And, and so we get to be here in this tree that spent its entire life integrating into the earth and into the ground. So it's like a very sacred table. Yeah. And, and we're sacred as well, right? Everything is sacred, whether yeah. we treat it that way or not. Right. So then- the sacredness of integration for you as a man and, and for all the women listening and just for us as a human being, regardless of gender, how would you, I almost said define, which is a very masculine question. <laughs> yeah. It's not about defining integration. How would you share about what integration truly is for all beings to be an integrated being with an integrated ego in here on the 3D, in this rock, in the middle of outer space? Well, to be integrated is to be who you really are. So we could say to be integrated is to be authentic. There's a lot of inauthenticity that, that you can see happening in the spiritual community because we have YouTube, we have books, we have all these outlets for knowledge, knowledge sharing. So most people who are on a spiritual path have a lot of spiritual knowledge and probably way more than people in the past have had who didn't have the internet and, and 24 access to any book they could ever want yeah, about every yeah. subject. So we're so blessed, right? That we have all this knowledge, but the ego can use whatever you've learned, but have not integrated. It can use it as a weapon against you. It can weaponize it. Uh, case in point with uh, a teaching like oneness, the ego will use any spiritual concept to trick you into bypassing, feeling something, uh, healing something, right? What you feel, you heal. Ego doesn't want you to sit with your pain and love it and forgive it. It wants you to bypass it. And it loves using spiritual teachings to do that. So for example, um, if I am God, if I'm the creator, then I'm already free and perfect. And I don't need to work on myself because I am that I am the one. And that's true from the absolute perspective, but from the relative perspective, you're not experiencing being God everywhere at all time and space, you're experiencing a certain body and a certain life and a certain story. And that's also divine. And so for me, the first um, rule for embodiment and integration and presence is always 
acknowledge the human level of a experience first before you rush off to the divine. Like you just can't be an embodied being if you're so up here in the higher chakras and never down here, right? Mm. Life is asking you to be a human first. That's why you are one. And so what's the, what's the human level of this situation asking of me? How can I be of service from a human level? And then we can bring in the divine perspective after that and say, now what is God doing from a greater picture in this experience? And then we can understand things like acceptance and surrender. So embodiment is an element of learning how to live, respond from love, which to me is just open-hearted acceptance of everything. I never see anything wrong in the universe, right? I never see anything incorrect or bad happening in the universe. Those labels have been removed from my awareness now. I see challenges. I see pain. You see evil, I'm sure. Right, like difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. You see people doing heinous things to one another. Yeah. You still discern what's going on, but you've dropped your judgments about it as rejecting part of creation and accepting part of uh, another part of it. We have to also love our enemies. We have to also love the darkness and the light so we can be integrated. And so the, the classic example of an unintegrated spiritual person is the love and light person where everything's just love and light. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, everything is love and light, but there's also an illusion going on called darkness that carries a lot of consequence and weight to it. And there's a lot of beings in this universe suffering greatly from that illusion. And so love would have us meet that illusion and accept it and embrace it and bring it in and bring it close, remind it of the truth rather than say, well, that's invalid and not love and light. So I reject it. Yeah. That's not embodiment, right? Mm, it's beautiful, man. That's really good. The only way that I've ever embodied anything is when I have been cut with a sword of adversity mm -hmm. so that I can bleed the pain out. And it's that shared bleeding of pain where you and I actually know that to be human is to experience pain. Mm -hmm. And if we bypass that in any way, it's just going to come on two, three, maybe 20 X. It's going to come back. Yeah. At a later point, it, it'll come back around. So it's so alluring to like, it's all good vibes, brother. I've seen sweatshirts, yeah. good vibes only. Good I vibes wanna, only. I want to like tear it off the person. Yeah. Like get that shit out of my face. Good yeah. vibes only is the biggest lie <laughs> on planet earth. It is the biggest spiritual bypass I've ever seen. Yeah. But there's also this other path where they get compassion too. Cause I probably did that as a trainer. Mm. All I ever focused on was shining light on everyone else. But when I held that light, there was all this darkness here that was not illuminated. Yeah. And so I can see that like, it's all actually love learning how to love itself more. Yeah. But it's easy to conceptualize that. So in the center of all of this, and I've, I've never actually, this is why I love podcasting, man. I've never thought about this before. Nice. So when I have on a guest like you, I get to throw ideas at you and it comes back different than it would with anyone else. Right. So I, I think about really the, the mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, financial ways that we teach and that are a part of the Breathe program and everything that I'm doing and, and that I'm honestly learning myself. All of that cannot exist if there's not the embodiment of love behind it. 100%. So how would you define this if you look at all the variables of your life and even you're about to get married soon, yes? Mm -hmm. In the next couple months or yeah, something? Yeah, seven weeks. Okay. That's pretty, that's close. Yeah. So, so think about what's drawing you to her and what's her name? Selena. Selena. So you and Selena getting married, potentially bringing life into the world, the perpetuation of your love, the understanding of wellness as you know it, how would you define a life well lived? What is well being to you? What, what is true wellness starting from within you? What is that definition? This would be a different answer two years ago. But now with, with total confidence and, and assurance in my heart, I can say a life well lived is a life in love and service. And that's because what God is, is service in a sense. God is the source of all life. God is the creator and sustainer of the universe. So God is in constant service to life from that perspective. And if giving and receiving are the same, that would imply the inverse is also true which is that life is service to God. And you say, well, how is that true? What do we always say when we say, what's the purpose of the universe? And the law of one says this, mm. the purpose of the universe is to help the creator learn what it is, to teach the creator what it is. And actually, if you want another mind blow, what the law of one says is that 
<laughs> every every galaxy, every star, every planet, every person is like an experiment that the creator is running where it literally doesn't know the results until the outcome happens. Every every universe that's ever been born was an experiment where the creator sets up certain parameters like uh, the 12 zodiac signs would be like the parameters the, the logos created to set up this experiment with and then it runs the experiment. So the universe is always serving and teaching the creator what it is. And Ra so beautifully in the law of one says, whether you choose the light or the darkness, you cannot not serve the creator. You're always teaching the creator what it is, either just like a buffet table. I can know what foods I like when I taste something good, just as much as when I taste something bad. Mm -hmm. And it gives meaning to each other. So the darkness and light are both serving the one creator. So life is also service to God. So God is at one from one lens serving life and then life is serving the creator back. So love is the only real response from creator to created. It's that endless flow of giving and receiving, giving and receiving. God creates the universe, the universe teaches God, vice versa, forever and ever. So when you live a life of love and service to others, which doesn't mean you don't serve yourself, yeah. you're also part of the universe, you gotta take care of your needs first, right? Otherwise you can't serve anyone. But when you live a life devoted to how do I bless others? How can I be just as invested in the happiness and the well-being of everyone I meet just as much as I am with my own? You join that endless cycle of giving and receiving of the universe mm. and you find a purpose and a function that's way deeper than you could have ever imagined. So much more rich and fulfilling than a life chasing pleasure and running from pain. <laughs> so good, man. Yeah. So good. Thank you for coming on the podcast, brother. Thank you for having me, man. So many beautiful things, you guys. I just want to leave you with this. Go to Aaron's YouTube channel. It's linked right here. Um, what is the URL we're going to put on the screen? Uh, YouTube.com slash Aaron Abke. Slash Aaron Abke. And I just want to say, like, there has been so many topics here that we've kind of scratched the iceberg. Some of them we did get into some good depth with, but there's so much rich content on your site. And um, we'll link that in the show notes too. I just want to like point out to everyone, myself included, that we are all learning as a child. And that's why if you follow religious texts, you would know that Jesus always put children when he spoke because children come to God, come to Jesus with the heart and mind of a child. And that's really what I think that would be the most powerful thing for you to share from this conversation with Aaron and I is like, open your mind and your heart to this conversation and these concepts as you would when you were a child, when you were playing in the sandbox and things just made sense because you weren't trying to figure them out. You were just learning and being in the experience of learning. Being. I can feel that in my heart. I can feel that in my body as, as we close out this podcast. And really the, the take home for me of all of this is that we truly are one. It's just so easy to forget. So from my heart to yours, man, thank you. And until Aaron and I see you again, we're both reminding you that all is one. It's not just an esoteric spiritual concept. It is really the fabric and the, the air that we breathe and the blood that goes in and out of our hearts. This is the truth yeah. that fuels all things. And this is what brings up emotion in me just to even talk about. So thank you, man, for being here again. And until we thank see you, you again, Aaron and I are both wishing you love and wellness. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you love this video, hit subscribe. That way you'll be automatically notified when new videos come out, new episodes, and also share this video with a friend. If you loved it, they're gonna love it too. Check out some of the videos on this screen that are perfectly curated based on the video you just saw. Make sure you follow me and I'll see you in the next video.